uh, Psalm 34, 1 through 10, when you have it, shout amen. amen. Very familiar passage of scripture. I will challenge your understanding of the text, but we're going to go deeper into this text today. I've been talking to the Lord about this text, and more importantly, God has been talking to me about this text. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked unto him and were lightened and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encampeth about them that fear him and delivereth them. Listen to this close. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is what? Blessed is the man that what? Trusteth in him. Oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. The young lions do lack and suffer, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. That means if you didn't get it, it wasn't good. That means if you didn't get it, it wasn't good. I'm believing God for some things right now. I told him I only want it if it's good. It looks good, but that's what got Eve in trouble. It's pleasant to my eyes, but that's what got her in trouble. It looks like it's good for food, but that's what got her in trouble. I only want it if it's good. I want to go back to that eighth verse again. Uh, this is my focal point. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that praises. Uh, excuse me. Blessed is the man that dances. Ble Let me see. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Can you say amen? amen? My subject this morning is the dividends of trust. The dividends of trust. Trust is extremely important, and yet we say very little about it. We talk a lot about praise. We are commanded to praise. That's something that we can do. Praise is about doing, trust is about being. There is a dividend that God will give you on trust, on trust, on trust. How many people trust God? The dividends of trust. There's some dividends you're going to reap if you trust Him particularly if you're in a tough time, God says, trust him. If you're in a painful time, trust him. If you're in a scary time, trust him. If you're in a time of uncertainty, trust him. You know why? He that have began a good work in you shall perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. God is consistent so you can if I sat in this chair and it gave way, I wouldn't trust it. But because every time I've ever sat on it, it held me up. I didn't check the legs before I sat down. I trust it. It's not a conscious effort. It's a result of consistency. Your God is consistent. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Oh, when I wake up in the morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hands have provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Let's pray while we're standing. Would you pray with us too? Let's all pray together. Spirit of the living God, 
fall fresh on us this morning. Endow us with the grace of delivering to your people what you have deposited in me. Release the kind of unction that causes people to be rejuvenated, not just emotionally, but spiritually. Help us to understand beyond our present comprehension what you are able to do. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. amen. You may be seated in the presence of God. Yeah, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. I want you to kick that text out and look at that text. I'm gonna start with the text, Psalm 34, one through 10. I'm gonna read it again, and then I'm going to go down the road. It occurs to me that Psalms 34, one through 10 is powerful, but strange. It's, it's, it's a collective of ideas that don't necessarily coordinate with each other. It almost seems contradictory. It is fragments of truth elements of orthodoxy. Individually, all of them have truth in their own merit, but when they are brought together and read together, they almost seem contradictory, and yet they have been woven together into one passage. For example, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. It makes good sense. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. It makes good sense. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. It makes good sense. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all of my fears. Wait, you were scared? I thought you was praising him. Now the same guy who says, I will bless the Lord at all times, says that he went through a period where he sought the Lord, he heard him, he delivered him, he was afraid. Next verse. They looked unto him and were lightened and their faces were not ashamed. Next verse. Ooh, this poor man cried. Wait, you was praising, I will, Bless the Lord at all times, his praise shall continually be in my mouth, does not go with this man, this poor, this poor man cried. And the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. This guy's in trouble, but he was praising God before and the praise was always in his mouth. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth him. This man had to be delivered. But a moment ago, he was talking about his praise shall continually be in my mouth. He sounded so happy a moment ago. He didn't sound like he was a poor man crying. He didn't sound like he was full of fear. He didn't sound like he had trouble. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. I get that. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. That's, that's, that's interesting, and yet it seems contradictory. They are fragmented truths a piece of polyester and a piece of wool and a piece of silk and a piece of cotton. And, 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 and all of them are laying out there in the same text. Several years ago, I had the privilege of hosting one of Africa's first elected female presidents, if not the first. Her Excellency, President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. And it was amazing. We attempted to entertain her in our home in the manner that reflected her prominence and honored her position. But the truth of the matter is, 
we had never had a president in our house before. So we were really, <laughs> my wife said, just you, you crazy. Uh, <laughs> So we were really spit shining everything and trying to get everything nice to entertain this historical figure that will go down in history as the first elected female president in Africa. There were some that became president by default and inherited the position because the previous president died for short interims of time. But Ellen Johnson Sirleaf was the first elected president of a country in Africa, and it hit the news worldwide, and she was in my house. <laughs> While we were having dinner, she presented me with a very meaningful gift. She gave us a quilt, and when she gave us the quilt, she explained something to me. She explained that in Liberia, the quilt is a symbol of liberty. Not just the flag, but the quilt itself reminds every Liberian of their liberty. You see, Liberia is lauded by the distinction of being Africa's first republic. It was its first republic. It was a country founded by freed slaves who were assisted in returning back to the motherland. And they went back to the motherland and received their freedom. You don't hear a lot about that. But there were not, not all the slaves that left Africa went to Brazil or went to the Caribbean or went to America. There were a group of slaves that were blessed to return back. Through the aid of an organization out of the UK, they were able to come back. Hence, Liberia, Liberty, is called Liberia because they were liberated slaves. Okay, and their, their, their gift is symbolized by a quilt and I'm going to tell you why. You have to understand the verses in the text remind me of Liberia in part because one moment he's talking about his praise shall continually be in my mouth, the next moment he's talking about his fears. You look around again, the same man that wrote the first part about his praise shall continually be in my mouth, turns around and says, this poor man cried. In isolation, the statements don't even go together. Sounds like a quilt. Most of us live our lives in fragmentation. We have fragments of joy, we have fragments of peace. We have fragments of holiness and we have fragments of carnality. Nobody wants to wave their hand, but it's true. We have fragments of great courage. And even the most courageous person wrestles with fragments of fear. We have fragments of happiness followed by fragments of great grief. Depending on which piece you pick up in our lives, you will say, oh, he's so joyous, but you just picked up a fragment. If you catch me at another moment, you'll say, oh, he's depressed. Isn't it amazing how you can go from one extreme to the other without warning in the same person? Forget the same passage or the same verse in the same person. That's why it takes years to know a person. You dated him in the sunshine, but you married him in the rain. You ought to date long enough to see how people are when they're happy and see how they are when they're sad and see how they are when they're depressed and see how they are when they're angry. I don't want to date anybody I haven't seen mad. Because some of the nicest people can turn into a gorilla when they get angry and shock you. And you would never believe that they would turn, that you married a tarantula. Like people's personality, life is fragmented. It's a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a little bit of the other and a little bit of the other that doesn't even go together. And some of us get stressed out because the pieces don't match. They don't go together. You can't even explain yourself because when people ask you how you are, you would sound schizophrenic if you answered. 
Somebody called me the other day and said, how do you feel about it? I said, I'm happy and nervous and glad and, and sad and, and scared and excited and, and, and adventurous and, and intimidated and, and vulnerable and, and victorious and all of it at the same time. All of that stuff conglomerated into one place. William Shakespeare said it this way, life is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and theory signifying absolutely nothing. He just gave up on it. He said, it's crazy. Somebody say it's crazy. He said, it's just crazy. It doesn't make any sense. It feels like it was told by an idiot. That is the feeling of this text. The, the feeling of this text is so discombobulated, discoordinated, not synergized. If you submitted this text to an English class, they would mark it all up because the thoughts are frayed. There are so many people sitting in this room right now whose thoughts are frayed. A little bit of polyester, a little bit of wool, a little bit of silk, and a little bit of cotton, and you're complicated. Because when you present yourself, the pieces don't go together. How many people are honest enough to admit to yourself that the pieces of you don't go together? I put on my coat this morning and, 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 the, and the white stuck out real good on this side, but it doesn't show on this side at all. It's nothing wrong with the, with the clothes. It's something wrong with my arms. One arm is longer than the other. I put on my shoes, I put on my left shoe first because my left shoe is just a wee bit bigger than my right foot. And so if it's good on the left, it's gonna be good on the right because they, 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 don't, uh, they don't match. They, they, they don't go together. And just like my body looks like it doesn't match, sometimes my personality doesn't match. How can David love God so much that he's dancing on the mountaintops, writing poetry to God and singing songs, and then turn around this poetic person who is, is such a left brain creative individual can turn around and get so mad that he cut off a cut off hundred foreskins and threw them down at Saul's feet. Extremes, extremes. Was he bipolar? I don't know. I'm not a psychiatrist. I can't diagnose his behavior, but, but, but it doesn't match up how David could be so committed in one area and then be on the rooftop looking over at Bathsheba talking about, Lord have mercy. Mm, 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 mm. How he could care for lambs and, and fight lions for lambs and, and do all of these wonderful things and be so kind and so caring at one moment and then be so vicious and cunning at another is beyond me. But such is life. Such is life. And Shakespeare just concluded, it doesn't make any sense. I give up on it. I can't explain it. Life is a tale told by an idiot. If I presented this text to an English scholar, they would give me an E because there is no synchronization of thought. How can his praise continually be in your mouth and yet you admit this poor man cried? How can I praise and cry? Praising and crying doesn't even go together. It doesn't make any sense, and yet it's in the same text, and worse still, it's in the same man. But Shakespeare was wrong when he says that life is a tale told by an idiot. He was completely wrong. In spite of the fragmentation of human experience, life is not a blanket, it's a quilt. It's, it's a quilt. It's not a blanket. You can't get it to all match up. And anytime you see something where it matches perfectly, it's always synthetic. People that match perfectly are always synthetic. Anytime everything lines out just the way it's supposed to be and there is no mar and there is no fluctuation and there is no deviation, run.
This Psalms is not born from a moment of great faith, nor is it a moment whereby David's destiny is unfolding. Quite the contrary, instead, hidden between the admonishment to bless the Lord and admonish us to praise him is emotional chaos. When I talk to my spiritual father about how things are going and maybe several people have died in the church and somebody's in the hospital and one of his kids is sick, he says, life is doing what life does. Jerking you around from praise to prayer from victory to discouragement, from crying like a poor man to blessing the Lord. All of that is a part of life and how you manage the inconsistencies determines how well you are stable as a person. If you're waiting for life to line out like a blanket, you'll never get anything done. You have to be able to thrive in chaos. You have to be able to deal with the confusion. You have to understand that you're always going to be a quilt, but that doesn't mean that it can't be stitched together. It's impossible not to note the fact that David remains consistent in his behavior of praise while his emotions are reacting to peril. So he's crying and praising. If his praise is continually in his mouth, he's crying and praising. That means if, if God delivered him, that means he's praising and bound. <laughs> if he delivered him from all of his troubles, that means that he praised him in trouble. David is talking to us about some things that we need to understand about God in order to be able to go forward in life. And they are very important things to be realized. Certainly there's a deep admonition to praise, but that's becoming a discipline. And when you become a disciplined praiser, you praise him no matter what, which is what they were singing about today. But the clarion call is not just to praise him, it's also to trust him. To trust him. Praising him and trusting him is two different things. I've seen people praise him all over the church and get in the car worried sick. I've seen people praise the Lord and honk their horn because the traffic is moving too slow in the parking lot or yell at our parking lot attendants or curse them out. I've seen them talk in tongues at the altar and curse out the parking lot attendant. Some of them are here this morning. And, and <laughs> it is possible to have unrelenting praise and still have a battle to trust the God we praise. See, I'm not just talking about praising him, I'm talking about trusting him. I'm talking about trusting him. Now, tr you don't know how much you trust him when things are going well. Trust is not proven in good times. Trust is proven in bad times. Trust is not proven when you get a promotion. Trust is proven when you get laid off. Trust is not proven when you're engaged. Trust is proven when you're about to divorce. I'm talk, can I talk to some real people today? Trust is not proven when you get what you want. Trust is proven when you lose what you had. Can you trust him in sorrow? Can you trust him in grief? Can you trust him with a lump in your breast? Can you trust him with a tumor? Can you trust him with a hernia? Can you trust him as you go up under anesthesia? Up under anesthesia, you can't go up under anesthesia talking in tongues. If you're going up under anesthesia, you have to go up under anesthesia. Your mouth can't be moving. You got to be ready to trust him in your head. I, I, I trust God. Don't get me wrong now, praise, praise is wonderful. And praise is important and we just got through doing it and I hope we do it again because praise summons God into our circumstances. The Bible says at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and God came where the praises were.
And anytime you praise God, it summons God. Psalms 22 and 3 says that God inhabits the praises of his people. Inhabits, inhabits. God moves into praise. We are not, don't misunderstand us onlookers and spectators. We are not praising God because we are emotional. This has nothing to do with whether you're an extrovert or an introvert, whether you're a quiet person or a loud person. The Bible says, let everything that has breath praise ye the Lord. Because when you praise him, you call him. Somebody praise him for a minute right now. <laughs> yeah. Yes. 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 You're summonsing him. You're sending the Batman signal into the air. He's coming to rescue you. When you praise him, you summons God. You, you, you provoke God to action. You provoke God to move. When you praise him, you summons God. And you don't have to be in church. You can be in your living room. You can be on your couch. You can have some rundown shoes on, stepping on the backs of the heels. But if you praise him, you can be in prison. But if you praise him, he'll come in a jail cell. You can be in a hospital. And if you praise him, he'll come in the hospital. You can be in a wake. But if you praise him, he'll come in the wake. You can be in a funeral. And if you praise him, he'll come in a way because praise summons God. Not only that, not only that, praise is a weapon. It's a strategic attack on the enemy. When you praise God, praise is a weapon. You can use it for warfare. Israel used it when they said, send Judah first. Judah means praise. And when they started praising God, things begin to happen. Praise is a weapon. When you're under attack, it's no time to be quiet. It's no time to fold your arms. It's no time to cross your legs. When you're under attack, praise is a weapon. Because the enemy wants to take the praise out of your mouth. And so you enter into his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise and be thankful unto him and bless his name because praise is a weapon. Are there any warriors in here? Are there any soldiers in here? Is there a military brigade in here? I'm a soldier in the army of the Lord. I got my war clothes on in the army of the Lord. If I die, let me die in the army of the Lord. I'm sanctified holy in the army of the Lord. I'm a soldier. I'm a baptized soldier. <laughs> Y'all don't know nothing about that. Number three, praise is a deterrent to isolation. It's how you remind yourself that you're not alone. It's how you remind yourself that you are not alone. For the angels of the Lord encamp about those that fear him. That fear is reverence. When you reverence God, angels wrap around you. So even if you've been telling people you live by yourself, if you praise God, you don't live by yourself. Because whenever you praise God, he takes his luggage and moves in the house with you. When your head hears your mouth praising God, he knows somebody else is in the house. Oh no, I heard voices in there. Somebody's in there. Yeah, you're right. When you start praising God, you're not riding in the car by yourself. You're going to work with angels. Anybody in here ever rode to work with angels? Praise reminds the soul that you are not isolated. In a world filled with isolation, we are so isolated, and yet we got more ways to contact each other than we ever had before. I'm, a, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Facebook, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, I, I haven't gotten on TikTok yet because I'm tired of people talking. 
so I didn't kick so they couldn't talk. But there's so many ways to get in touch with you. You can text you, you can tweet you, you can call you, you can yell at you. There's so many ways to communicate. And we have this huge community of what we call friends and followers. And yet beneath all of this conglomerate of human species, we are more lonely and more isolated than we have ever been in all of our lives. How can you have 5,000 followers and still be lonely? How can you go into a crowded North Park Mall and still be lonely? We fight isolation because there are all kinds of people that are connected to us, but they don't have intimacy. We have lost the art of intimacy into me see. But when God comes in, he's already seen everything. There is nothing hidden from him with whom we have to do. The Bible says all things are naked before him. All things are exposed. I don't care if you cut off all the lights, pull all the blinds, pull all the windows shut, jump up under the blankets. He can see up under the covers. There is nothing hidden from him with whom we have to do. What praise is not, it may be, uh, uh, it may summons God in your circumstances, it may be a weapon in the time of battle, it may be a deterrent to isolation, but what praise is not is a panacea. It is not a panacea. A panacea is something that, is, that says it is a universal cure. It's a cure-all. It's a cure for all ills. The word panacea that we use today actually comes from Greek mythology. Panakia was a Greek god who allegedly was supposed to be able to heal anything. She is the daughter of Asapias, and in Greek mythology, a panacea had the ability to be able to heal anything. Praise is not a panacea. Yet it's all we sing about, it's all we talk about, it's all we mention, it's all we allude to, but praise is not a panacea. Praise does not necessarily create trust. You can praise God and still be worried. You can praise God and still be scared. You can praise God and still be sick. You can praise God and still be nervous. You can praise God and still have hand tremors. You can praise God and still have a pinched nerve. You can praise God and still have your check bounce. You can praise God and still be evicted. You can praise God. Y'all aren't gonna talk to me. Come on, I want some real people in here. Praise is not a panacea. It is not a cure-all. It doesn't fix everything. It doesn't straighten everything out. The real truth of the matter is there's a great deal of difference between praise and trust. Praise is an action. Trust is a noun. Trust is a state of being. Do you understand what I'm saying? When I talked to you earlier and I began to talk about President Sirleaf and her coming, you must understand that she was not the first one to bring a quilt. In the early 1800s, she had a predecessor who brought a, queen, who brought a quilt to Queen Victoria. It took her 50 years to be able to do it. She was a former slave a literal former slave, not second, third generation, a literal former slave who, who put together a quilt for Queen Victoria. Her name is Martha Ricks. And she brought the first quilt from Liberia to the queen. And here she is, a former slave in the room with the Queen of England. She walks into the room with the Queen of England with a quilt, a quilt that was made out of satin and embroidered with coffee trees, with berries, uh, berries and a border of passion flowers. A quilt that she had stitched with her own two hands to bring to the Queen. 
a quilt made out of different substances and different fabrics, all different colors woven together. And she made something beautiful out of rags. And when I read Psalms 34, I begin to realize that Psalms 34 is teaching us that life is a quilt and that we are quilts and yet God can make something beautiful out of rags. One person sees disjointed, disconnected rags in the text and the other person sees a quilt. God is a quilt maker. No wonder Jacob made for Joseph a coat of many colors. He took colors that had nothing to do with each other and stitched them together until they became a coat, a coat of distinction. Its distinction was its variation. I never will forget when I was a young boy, my mother gave me one year for, for Christmas a, a, a savings book to Kanawha Valley Bank. And she gave me, you remember Canal Valley Bank? She gave me a savings book to Canal Valley Bank. And every time I would cut a lawn or do grass, I would put $5 in it until I got enough money in it for Christmas time so that I wouldn't have to give her her money back for Christmas. Because you know you are buying your own Christmas presents when your kids give you something most of the time when they're little. I decided I was going to break that trend and I brought her this, it's what leather, it was suede. It was a suede coat and I never will forget, I don't know why I remembered it, but there was a tag on the coat that said, do not be disturbed by the variations of colors or discolored spots. It is proof of its authenticity. <laughs> Authentic people are complicated. Authentic people have variations. Authentic people have differences. Authentic people are poor men crying and yet continual praise in their mouth and in trouble and delivered out of trouble. Authentic people have ups and downs and peaks and valleys and winter and spring and summer and fall. Authentic people talk faith and go home and lay down in fear. Authentic people believe God and yet say help my unbelief. Authentic people are a quagmire of dis and disconnected things. Authentic people are schizophrenic. Authentic people are bipolar. Authentic people are the kinds of people, it depends on when you catch me, what you get. Authentic people, one day you get wool, one day you get silk, one day you get leaves, one day you get plain. Authentic people are complicated and yet we are fearfully and marvelously made. We are created in the image of God. Our God is love. Our God is love. But our, also, our God is also a God of wrath. Our God gives life. And our God takes life away. Our God is authentic. You cannot tie him down. That's why he told Moses, I am that I am. Don't try to explain me. Don't try to make a blanket out of me. I'm a quilt. I am that I am. Before it's over, before your life is over, you're going to say I'm bread. And the moment you think I'm bread, you're going to find out I'm water. And the moment you think I'm water, you're going to find out I'm a cloud. And the moment you think I'm a cloud, I'm going to turn into fire. Our God, we were created in the likeness of God. We are quilted. We were made. We were fearfully and marvelously made in the image of a God who is a quilt. One moment you see God saving babies. He saved Hagar's baby in the desert and you would know that God loves babies until you read Exodus where God killed all the babies in Egypt. Oh, y'all quiet. God killed all the babies in Egypt and told Pharaoh, I'm going to kill all your sons until you let my son go. That don't sound very nice. That don't sound very loving. That sounds like God is mad. Sometimes God gets mad. 
and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the people and the anger of the Lord rose up and the anger of the Lord and yet God is love. He is the Prince of Peace. And yet the Prince of Peace said, I came not to bring peace but a sword. God is complicated. He kills some people for doing other things. It's the same thing that somebody else did, he let them get by with it because our God is complicated. Oh, stay with me. Now, the thing about quilts, I grew up with, uh, my grandmother's had quilts. Both of my grandmothers had quilts. My last memory of my mother's mother was sitting in a chair, in a rocking chair, with a quilt over her legs. And it was made out of remnants and rags and fabrics that she'd taken from different places. And on one side it was colorful and it was beautiful and it was ornate and stuffed no doubt with cotton. And then it had the backing. The backing was always solid. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. You don't see a quilt that's quilted on both sides. Something has to be solid. Something has to be stable. Something has to be consistent. Something has to be unmovable. Something has to be unchangeable. And uh, while it is unchangeable, everything else can have variations in it. But you take that which is a variable and sew it into that which is solid, and then you have a quilt. This text is a quilt. And so when I read the quilt and saw how many different fabrics were in the text, I wanted to check the back. So my next question was, what was going on with David when he wrote this text? So let's flip the quilt over. Can I go deeper with this thing? Let's flip the quilt over and see why David's front end sounds so schizo. We've got to get to the back end to see what provoked the text to be written in the first place. The reality of the matter is David does not write this while he's dancing on the mountaintop. David does not write this while he's killing Goliath. David does not write this as he's playing the harp in the palace. David does not write this as he has crowned the king of Israel. No, David writes this at a time that Saul is still alive and trying to kill him. And he is on the run from Saul. And he is run the run from his own people. And there is no rejection like the rejection of your own people. Nothing hurts as bad as the rejection of your own people because you think your own people are your backing. But God had to show him that your own people are not your backing. Oh, America, hear me today. Your own people are not your backing. At a time that we're breaking down into tribes and you're either for us or against us and we're fighting over black and white and brown and Democrat and Republicans and mask and no mask and all kinds of stuff, your own people are not your backing because people change and they fluctuate and they go back and they go forward. And if you put all your hopes in the group you attach to, you you will always be disappointed. They will always let you down. They will always sell you out. They will always leave you hanging because you cannot count on people to have your back. I know they love to tell you I got your back, but the devil is a lie. They do not have your back. The only one who has your back is God. God has got your back. Somebody shout, God has got my back. My, my front can have many textures. It can have many colors. It can have different feels. You can have silk and corduroy. You can have corduroy and wool. You can have wool and polyester, and you can still make the quilt. But when it comes to the back, it has to be one fabric, consistent and stable, that holds it all together. There's one thing that's been holding you together. There's one thing that kept you from losing your mind. There's one thing that kept you from 
from having a nervous breakdown. There's one thing that kept you from committing suicide. There's one thing that kept you from becoming an alcoholic. There's one thing that kept you from driving the car off the cliff. That when everybody forsook you, when my mother and father forsake me, the Bible says the Lord will take me up. When my own mother and father forsake me, the Lord will take me up. So stop crying about what your daddy did and what your mama did because even if they didn't have your back, God sent me to tell you, I got your back. Elbow somebody telling me he's got my back. If you jump on me, you got to jump on him because God has got my back. If you fight me, you got to fight God because God has got my back. If you hate me, you hate God because God has got my back. If you got your foot on me, you got your foot on God because God has got my back. He's got my back when I'm right. He's got my back when I'm wrong. He's got my back when I'm weak. He's got my back when I'm strong. He's got my back when I'm scared. He's got my back when I'm faithful. He's got my back when I'm consistent. He's got my back when I'm unstable. That's why I'm here to praise him. Because he is the one that has my back. Now let everything that have breath. one of you who was in the valley when they were praising God and he had you hold your hand up and you said you were in the valley, I came to tell you God's got your back. God's got this. You're going through trouble, but God's got this. You're in a low place right now, but God's got this. You're backed up against a wall, but God's got this. You got a tumor, but God's got this. They said it was cancer, but God's got this. Your heart is overwhelmed, but God's got this. Your heart isn't got the right beat, but God's got this. Your blood pressure is up, but God's got this. You're about to be on dialysis, but God's got this. Your mama's in the hospital, but God's got this. Your daddy's got cancer, but God's got this. I need 30 seconds of crazy pray for the back of the quilt. Yes. 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 I want you to say it three times. God's got this. Again. Again. I wanted your ears to hear your mouth say, God's got this. Your blood pressure just dropped down. Your nerves just calmed down. Your peace just began to invade your soul. You're not in this by yourself. God's got this. Shout a hallelujah. David writes this text down. David writes this. See, it's y'all's fault I can't finish fast because y'all make me shout and holler and stuff. Hallelujah. Oh my God. <laughs> I think I needed to hear it myself. God's got this. Is there anybody else in here that needed to hear God's got this? That the battle is not yours, it belongs to God. Hallelujah. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Because if I can get to God, I know God's got this. If I call you, you might not answer. If I text you, you might not respond. But every time I call God, every time
this. God's got this. God's got my back. God's got my backing. I might be unstable, but God's got my backing. I might act crazy, but God's got my back. I may talk like an idiot, but God's got my back. I may talk out of my head, but God's got my back. I may contradict myself, but God's got my back. My front might be many colors, but my back is stable. My back, my back, my back, my back, my back, my back, my back. Can I go deeper? Sit down and let me go deeper. God's got my back. Somebody needed to hear that this morning. Somebody needed this word from the Lord. I know I got a word from the Lord. I could feel it when I was getting it. I could feel it in my hands. I could feel it in my head. I could feel it in my feet. God said you're going to give an answer to what somebody's been praying about. Tell my people I got this. I feel this. David is running from a man he protected. David is running from a man he admired. David is running from a man that he used to play for. David is running from a man whose demons he was familiar with, whose musical ability had cast the demons out of him. The only way Saul could get to sleep was for David to play for him in one season. <laughs> then the season changed and the same man who hired him is now trying to kill him. I wish I had a witness in this place. Have you ever had people turn on you? Have you ever had people switch on you? Have you ever had people try to destroy you? the very people that you admired and had an emotional investment in are now trying to destroy you. It makes you nervous. It makes you scared. It makes you uh, slowful to open up to people because you can't tell what they're going to do next. David is now running from Saul, which means he's running from Saul's army, which means he's running from an army he used to lead. He's running from his own people. The people who ate like him and dressed like him and danced like him and moved like him and motioned like him. He's running from his own culture. His own background, his own ethnicity is trying to kill him. It is so bad that David ends up hiding amongst the Philistines. The Philistines had always been an enemy. If you're not careful, the rejection of your people will drive you into the camp of your enemy. Come on with me. Come on with me. Come on. I'm just showing you the backside of the text. And there he is in this situation with the Philistines and he gets with the Philistines and he thinks maybe if I go into the Philistines, they won't hurt me. Maybe they won't hurt me. Maybe they won't remember that I killed Goliath. But as soon as he moved in with the Philistines, the first thing the priest did was say, aren't you? See, that's the trouble with backsliding. If you ever really get saved, You can go back in the strip club if you want to, but you dance like a deacon in the strip club 
because once God puts his hands on your life, they're going to know you're not really one of them. You can play strip poker if you want to, but take off all your clothes and you're still going to be a child of the king. Once God puts his hands on you, it will never come off. It's indelible. It's immutable. It's unchangeable. It will never pass away. Ask Peter. You can warm yourself by the fire, but they'll point you out and say you've been with Jesus. If you've ever really been with Jesus, you can never get that out out of your skin. It'll come out of your pores. When your car slides, you'll holler, oh Jesus. Everybody in the car be cussing, but you'll holler, oh Jesus. Is there anybody in here that's been with Jesus? <laughs> David had a reputation for military prowess. He had led the armies of Israel that he's now running from. And the priest says to him, the priest says to him, uh, you ain't no Philistine. Every backslider in this room, I want you to know Every runaway girl, every prodigal son, they looking at you saying, you ain't, you, ain't, you, you ain't no Philistine. He says to him, the priest says to him, do you want the sword? Because we've got the sword that killed Goliath. But David cannot win this battle with the sword. David is afraid that when they find him, they're going to imprison him, or worse still, they're going to kill him. And if ever was a time that he needed a sword, it was now. But God had a plan. I don't know who this is for. God said you cannot fight today's battle with yesterday's weapon. What used to work will not work in this situation. God said you're gonna have to come back to me because I've got the plan for the problem you're facing right now. And the plan was David pretended to be insane. So he started beating his head against the gate. Just banging his head up against the gate. And they were bringing him to Achish, the king. And, and when the king saw him, David was beating his head up against the gate. And then he started scribbling all over the wall, just anything, just writing all up and down and sideways on the wall. And then he starts dropping spittle into his beard until his beard was covered with spit, his head was banging against the wall, and his hand was scribbling. The Philistines wanted nothing to do with him. Achish the king said, can't you see he's crazy? Why did you let him in here? Don't you think I have enough crazy people already? In, in Philistia that you would bring him in here amongst us. I don't need another crazy man. Put him out. He was like the Liberians. He escaped because God had his. You're not going to escape because of your sword. You're going to escape because God has your back. I want to go deeper with this. He managed to escape. He got away. You are going to get out of this. Wait a minute. Without your sword,
Samuel 21, 8 through 10 says he got the victory without fighting. Stop fighting. The strategy of the Lord is smarter than that. See, when God has a plan, it's always a crazy plan. Who am I talking to? The Lord told me to tell you he's going to give you a crazy plan. God's plan sound mad. Stuff like build a boat in your backyard. Noah. Elisha, leave your inheritance and all of this property and all of your relatives to go take a menial job washing the hands of a prophet. That's crazy. Or, Elijah, go to a bankrupt widow and there I'm going to sustain you. That's crazy. Or, Elijah, throw a stick in the water to retrieve an ox head. That's crazy. Or, I'm going to send a backslidden prophet to run a revival in Nineveh. That's crazy. Or Moses, stretch forth a stick and the Red Sea is going to get up out of your way. That's crazy. Or go down across an innocent man so guilty men can be saved. That's crazy. Or I'm going to call a Christian terrorist to write most of the New Testament epistles. That's crazy. Or humble yourself so I can exalt you. That's crazy. Or whosoever loses his life shall find it. That's crazy. Or give me two fish and five loaves of bread and I'll feed 5,000 people. That's crazy. Or go to the tomb where you buried your brother and roll the stone away. That's crazy. God has a crazy plan. It's not going to make sense to you. All of you rational people, you're going to have to put your rationality behind you and go with something that sounds totally crazy because God is going to bring you out of your situation. God is going to bring you out of your trouble. God is going to bring you out of your dilemma. If your ego doesn't stop you from being willing to do something crazy, nudge your neighbor and tell him, I'm about to do something crazy. I'm about to do something I never did before. I'm about to act mad. I'm about to bang my head against the wall. I'm about to spit in my own beard. I'm about to write up and down the side of the wall. Whatever God has for you, it's a crazy blessing. They didn't hear me. I'm going to tell you, whatever God has for you is a crazy blessing. They kind of heard me. I'm going to try y'all. Whatever God has for you is a crazy blessing. You've got to be crazy. You've got to be crazy. If you're going to do this, you've got to be crazy. I'm looking for some crazy people. Paul said, I'm a fool for Christ. Is there anybody that's ready to act a fool? We're in a season of trouble. Finances are crazy. Gas is going up. The recession is on our heels. But God said, if you're willing to act a fool, I swear I'm going to bless you. I'm going to pull you out of this rut. I'm going to pull you out of this hole. I'm going to pull you out of this dilemma. But you got to be willing to act a fool. Paul said, I'm a fool for Christ. I want to preach to a room full of fools, a room full of people that are step out of a boat and walk out on water, don't have no bridge, don't see no rocks, but I'm going to walk on it anyway. God's getting ready to take you away that would blow your mind. I need a crazy praise up in this place. Praise on YouTube. I need a praise on Facebook.
book. This is a time that God is going to elevate crazy people, not people who play it safe, not people who play it cool, not people who play it easy, not people who color in the lines. You got to get outside of the lines. I'm tired of coloring in the lines. I'm going to get out the lines and do my own thing. It may be scribbling, but it's going to work for you. It may look bad, but it's going to work for you. I need 30 seconds of crazy praise in this place. Trumpet, shout unto God, like 
It's already done.
lost your mind, ain't got nothing to lose, might as well bang my head, might as well scribble on the wall, might as well watch God bring me out, I'm about to go crazy, before I be back, before I go back, before I give up. trust you enough to drop my sword. Yes, I trust you enough to follow your plan. Yes, I trust you enough to do things that don't make no sense. Yes, what you gonna do with that lunch? What is this lunch against so many people? Why you gonna roll that stone away? By now he stinks. What is shouting at a solid wall gonna do? Why you want me to build a boat in the backyard? Stop asking so many questions. and just get that crazy trust that though he slay me yet shall I trust him I'm gonna trust you Lord I'm gonna trust you the boat is kind of rocky but I'm gonna trust you. The 
winds are boisterous, but I'm gonna trust you. My heart is broken, but I'm gonna trust you. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and delivered him. He delivered him out of all of his troubles. All of his troubles. Not some of his troubles. All of his troubles. He delivered him out of all of his troubles. Lift your hands and open your mouth to God and begin to praise him. All of my troubles. All of my troubles. King Achish said, let him go. Let him go, he's crazy. Let him go, he lost his mind. Let him go, he's a fool for you. Let him go, he's beside himself. Let that woman go. Turn that man a loose. Turn that debt a loose. Turn that crisis a loose. Open your mouth, let God hear your voice. He knows your voice. He knows your voice. He knows your voice. 